Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship and a special welcome to visitors and guests among us. A joy to have you here this day. We are drawing into the final weeks of our Lenten season, and so this Wednesday is our final midweek service. Wednesday we have services at noon, 5.30 and 7 o'clock, all accompanied by meals. So we encourage you to come as we conclude our series, Luther, Lent, and the Reformation. A week from today is Palm Sunday. And so we begin then that journey through Holy Week, including Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Eve, and Easter services. And I invite you to experience the entirety of Holy Week uh, from Palm Sunday all the way through uh, so that your Easter may be all the more blessed with the good news of the resurrection. Uh, the service times and all the information regarding Holy Week is on our website. There's lots of details as well regarding some special things happening around Easter, so take note of that, including an insert uh, for you to perhaps provide some flowers to accentuate the beauty of our sanctuary on Easter weekend. Our spotlight today features uh, the great Bethel Beardoff concludes today with the de-bearding of either Pastor Burgraff or Tyler Schoenrock. At the time of this writing, $704 has been raised for the National Lutheran Youth Gathering participants. And I have it on good authority that Pastor Jason is uh, going to be losing his beard for sure uh, today. Uh, so that is really good news for many folks. Um, and we will be gathering in the uh, gathering area there, the Narthex area, to witness that firsthand. So join in that uh, after worship. People continue to be touched by the devotional materials written by Bethel members for our Lenten booklet. Thank you for that gift in this Lenten season. And the ELCA continues to support Christian churches in Jerusalem amidst efforts by the government to confiscate properties and levy taxes against the churches. And you're certainly encouraged to look at our national church body website, the ELCA.org, um, that will have more information about various uh, things related to that. I invite you to stand at this time to greet those who come to worship with you today. Invited to remain standing as we gather now for a time of confession and receiving words of God's forgiveness and grace. During the season of Lent, we are called to return to the Lord with all our heart. Let us confess our sin and seek reconciliation with God and neighbor. Merciful God, you sent Jesus Christ to save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We fail in love, neglect justice, and ignore your truth. Have mercy on us and wash away our sin. Create in us clean hearts for the sake of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Behold, now is the acceptable time, now is the day of salvation. Almighty God has mercy on you, forgives you all your sins, and brings you to everlasting life. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope in the world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. John, the twelfth chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I invite children to come forward for the children's word. to you. How's it going this morning? Real good. good. All right. Excellent. Good to hear. We heard something in a reading from Jeremiah, and Jeremiah said, from the least of them to the greatest. From the least of them to the greatest. Now, how many of you up here think that you're tall? Yeah, you may be tall for your age. I bet some of you are. But compared to everyone out here... Not very tall. At least not yet. You will be, I suspect. 
you might be called the least of them, at least by height. And some out here would be called the greatest by height. Well, how many of you are good at tiddlywinks? How many of you have ever played tiddlywinks? One. All right. Are you the greatest tiddlywink player ever? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, I like that self-confidence. <laughs> well, whether you're the greatest or maybe not so the greatest, God has a word for you. Or how about hide-and-seek? How many of you have ever played hide-and-seek? I can tell you that my boys like to play hide-and-seek, and, seek, and uh, I can let you in on a secret. They're not very good at hiding. <laughs> but they love the game. They may not be the greatest hide-and-seek players yet. That's okay. I like it that way, actually. But God has a word from them. From the least to the greatest, from the shortest to the tallest, from the greatest tiddlywink player to the worst, from the worst hide-and-seekers to the best. God has a word for you. It is that you will know him and he will know you. This is his great promise. We heard it in Jeremiah. We heard it again from Jesus. So I want you to know this. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you call us from the greatest to the least to remind us that it is not about us. It is about you. It is about what you've done for us. So remind these, your children, who are great in their own way because you've made them so that they are yours. Bless them and bless their families in the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You can go back and sit with your families. Brothers and sisters who hear this word, the voice of God has come for your sake. And though it may sound like thunder some days, and though maybe it may sound like it's not even important or relevant some days, it has come for you. And in this voice, in this word, there is a new way of being you. You might wonder about that because you've been you for a long time. But there's a new way of being you now. In light of God's forgiveness of your sins, you are new. And even now you might think, well, that's the same as it's always been. I've heard that before. But let me tell you today that through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you now know God and God now knows you. Not only in judgment, which is how we live most of our days, judging this or that, feeling judged one way or the other. But now you know God and he knows you in grace and forgiveness. Forgiveness for all you've ever done and for all that you've left undone. You are forgiven. Do you understand what this means? It means that you have peace with God and therefore with the world as well. That might come as a surprise to you. You may not feel that peace yet today. And though the world may not know this news yet either, and while you may forget it from time to time, this voice has come for your sake. And this means that because Jesus defeated death, you will be raised from the grave. This is the new covenant, or the new testament, or the new promise that Christ has brought to you. Amen. You know, it is always a little daunting to hear from our pal, the prophet Jeremiah. It's always a little daunting. He's a colorful guy, but he has a hard edge. Have you ever heard of the Iron Chef? You probably have. Well, God calls Jeremiah the Iron Prophet. If you ever heard of a, a Jeremiah? Maybe some of you have. You know, if you have, you know it's a long complaint. And it's a word that's directly related to our book from Jeremiah. It's one of the longest books in the Bible, 52 chapters. And it's almost exclusively a complaint against Israel and Judah. A call for them to repent of their idolatry. A rebuke for their sin. And what was their sin that deserved such a Jeremiah? 
such an iron prophet. Well, they had turned from God, the Lord, to the gods of their neighbors, to the gods of vice and pleasure and self-centeredness. They followed their own hearts instead of God and his word. They justified themselves. They made themselves right. They believed that they were right instead of repenting to God. And how would God get the attention of such a people who would not listen to him, who thought they were right already? Well, he sends Jeremiah. And at one point in the book, Jeremiah is instructed to buy a new loincloth by God, to wear it and then bury it. You maybe recall this in the 13th chapter. It's a little strange. God tells Jeremiah that this will show Judah what they had become when they followed their own heart and other gods. He instructs Jeremiah then to, bear, to, after he's buried it, to dig it up and show that it is good for nothing. And indeed it was. God says, this is who you are as a people when you do not trust me. God said to to Jeremiah, for as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. Now on the one hand, here is a new image, at least new to many of our ears, for a relationship with God. The people of God, you are like a loincloth for God, clinging to his every move. But on the other hand, and perhaps more importantly, God says they would not listen. And therefore, like this dirty loincloth, they were good for nothing. And much of Jeremiah goes on like this. It is a Jeremiah, a long complaint. And as much as we follow other gods, as much as we follow our own hearts over God's word, It is a true word for us as well. Yet today, in our reading from chapter 31, we happen to hear one of the few bright spots that Jeremiah brings in this long book, and it is an earth-shaking promise. Have you ever bit into a sour grape? Have you ever bit into a grape expecting it to be nice and sweet, and it turns out just to be, oof, real sour? We've had a few clumps of grapes like this in the past year. They will turn your teeth on edge. Your eyes will squint like nothing before because of the sourness. Well, if most of Jeremiah is like eating sour grapes, getting to our reading today in chapter 31 is like sinking your teeth into one of the sweetest, juiciest grapes you've ever tasted. It is good news, not only to our mouths, but to our ears and to our hearts. Jeremiah starts with some sourness. He says, yes, you have not held up your end of the bargain. You have not feared, loved, and trusted God above all other things, and this has gotten you in trouble. And you've not loved your neighbor as yourself, and this has gotten your neighbor in trouble as well. In short, Jeremiah says you're a mess. But the days are coming when I will make a new promise for you. I will put my word in your heart and you will know me from the least of you to the greatest of you. That is to say, it's not about what you've done or who you are. God is coming to you and what's he going to do? He continues, for I will forgive your iniquity and remember your sin no more. Jeremiah says the days are coming, but we know that they have indeed already come in Jesus Christ. And so when we hear Jesus in the gospel this morning, we know that he is nearing the day of his death. Actually, the ordering of the gospel text today is after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which we'll celebrate this next Sunday. Many are still wanting to raise Jesus up in glory as their new king, perhaps like the Greeks who want to see him But Jesus reminds his followers that he will be raised up in a different kind of glory. On a cross. A crucifixion. And what a disappointment to his followers this is. And even Jesus' soul is troubled 
by this necessary action. But at that moment in our gospel reading, a voice comes from heaven saying, I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again. And Jesus responds, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of the world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Here is the new covenant. Here is the new promise. Now when we are, as far as we are in Lent, the fifth Sunday in this season, we know what's around the corner. We know that we're soon going to hear the story of Jesus being raised up. I want you to know that this is necessary, not just for the liturgical calendar, but it's necessary for Jesus to draw you to himself. That while God's people would not listen, the voice has come for their sake. While you would not listen, the voice has come for your sake. In Jesus Christ, you have peace now with God. Since he has defeated death, so too is death defeated for you and for your whole family in Christ. What a sweet grape you have been given in this news. And it is sweet. Now this doesn't mean that you might not lose some things along the way, as Jesus warns. Some of us may even lose our beards. It could happen fairly soon. I read the gospel this morning in a new light. Hearing Jesus' words, those who love their beards will lose them. (laughs) But those whose wives do not love their beards may go home happy. (laughs) We may lose things like this that we treasure. Jesus says so. But when you have his word, you have something much better. You have life eternal. We may even lose, and this is no joke, our lives. In fact, we will one day. We may lose them for the sake of the faith. But Jesus says you will gain eternity. For you are held in his hands. This is the new covenant. The New Testament. The gospel of Jesus. That he has defeated sin, death, and the devil for your sake. So I want you to hold on to this sweet grape today. Now you are holy loincloths. Now you may freely cling to God in all that you do. For God has put his word in your heart. That is faith. And it is yours by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of the day.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you have made a new covenant with us in Jesus. In these next two weeks, we trace the steps that lead to the fulfillment of that covenant in the cross and the resurrection. Move our spirits in this journey as we worship the one who is glorified in a way only you can glorify. Help us to follow the servant in serving others. Lord, in your mercy. You have declared, O God, that you will be our God and we will be your people. Give the confidence of that loving and living certainty to Jim Preston on the loss of his wife Karen. Give that confidence of care to those whose bodies need your healing touch, among them Ellsworth Tucker, Dave Kaler, Tom Loglin, and Sammy Chesney. Lord, in your mercy. You have called us to serve, and you give us so many opportunities. It may be offering compassion to a family member, neighbor, or colleague. It may be giving the gift of time. It may be contributing to food share so, so that others may eat, or to the Bihar Project so that those most in need can be lifted out of poverty and hunger. Make us generous in giving, even as you gave everything for us. Lord, in your mercy. Bless our church leaders, especially our church council as they meet and keep us faithful to our ministry. Bless those who gather in Bible study this week and those who lift up their voices and instruments to your praise. Bless us as we worship, learn, and serve. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For the receiving of the morning gifts, you may be seated.
Let us pray. Merciful God, receive the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving and the offering of our lives, that following in the way of the cross, we may know the joy of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but give us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. God's holy meal shall be served in six stations in the front of the sanctuary. All of our bread is gluten-free. If you would prefer white grape juice to the red wine, please let your server know. The ushers will call upon you. Please be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending song number 618. of Christ, you are claimed and you are free.